This video is absolute gold. This is from several years ago. I had the opportunity to meet virtually meet one of my absolute teacher heroes, like probably someone that I took more from and it inspired my class than any other teacher that I can think of. His name is Rafe Esquith. He is a former teacher at Hobart Elementary School in Los Angeles. And I wanted to pull two parts out of this that I thought might be really useful for folks based on you know some of the conversations I've been hearing lately. The first thing that Rafe is going to address is Rafe is asking, answering the question, how to avoid burnout. And so he has two particular answers for that. And then later in the conversation, he is going to talk about, I, I asked him this question, which was, how did you know when what you were doing was actually good? Like that it was going to make a difference, that this is something that you should keep doing. And his answer was much different than, than I kind of thought it would be, but I still, I think it is great. And I think it is going to bring an enormous amount of value to all of you. So please enjoy these two quick clips with my hero, Rafe Esquith. Um, there are two secrets to my not burning out. One of them is I'm married to an extraordinary woman. And uh, Barbara is the brains behind my classroom. I easily could have been one of those teachers who thought, well, if a kid has 95, he's better than a kid with 85 because the test score says so. I could have bought into that whole theme. It's easier, isn't it, CJ? You just look at the test scores and that's who that kid is. And Barbara was the one who slapped me around and said, no, Rafe, you know, you have to build good people. You have to build character and moral development. And when I said, Barbara, that's much harder. She said, well, then your job's harder, Rafe. Yeah. <laughs> that's tough. But when I'm having a bad day, knowing I go home to a woman who I love dearly, I can't burn out. But the other secret that I use that I really encourage teachers to do is to try, and it's not that hard these days, stay in touch with your former students. I have an army of former students. You have no idea. I'll bet. Uh, I mean, for example, if you ever go to the Hobart Shakespearean website, I couldn't build a website to save my life. It's one of my former students who now works for Facebook. And he's a very wealthy guy wow. and he does all the work for me. Um, all, much of the legal work for my class and, and getting permission to do things, it's done by former students who are now lawyers. So I have this army. And when I'm feeling down, to have dinner with these guys and, and, and girls and to hear from them in line and get cards from them and to hear about their marriages or their college experiences, it reminds me, okay, you've had a bad day. But one of those kids in front of you is going to be writing to you in 10 years. And that does help me from burning out. It reminds me because any teacher out there knows we certainly society isn't giving you a pat on the back. And oftentimes you don't have administrators giving you a pat on the back or even colleagues sometimes because our system. Yeah. And I'm sorry if this hurts people's feelings. It is filled with mediocrity. Uh, we just lost Tom Petty in his song, The Last DJ, where he wisely sang, we celebrate mediocrity. And we won't in my classroom, but it can burn you out being around mediocrity. So I surround myself with former students and my family to keep my level high and to keep me happy. That's my fight with burnout, former students. You know, it's funny. I don't hear, I hear more high school teachers talk about connect, keeping up with students. Um, and how it has been, is been, is fifth grade been tough to connect? Is that a lot of you on the front end of that? Or did the kids just come back? Or what does that look like? How do you make that? CJ, like a lot of things, it was an accident. Here's what happened. I failed miserably in my first couple of years because I taught fifth and sixth grade and I thought I did a real good job. <laughs> God, I was an idiot. Anyway, <laughs> I was. And the kids went off to middle school and I heard in gangs, drugs, prostitutes and i'm like what this kid was wonderful this this sweet kid yeah. is a gang and i was very i was just crushed and again my brilliant wife said well here's what you have to do rafe you got to remember middle school is tough in the best situations it's a terrible age so i started a saturday program where my former students in grades six seven eight and nine would come back read literature with me study Shakespeare, study music, and travel with me to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival every summer. We built a bridge, and where the press always got it wrong, they'd say, oh, it's so wonderful. The kids come back to be with Rafe. No, they don't. Yeah. They came back to be with each other. 
because when they went off to their various middle schools, being bright kids, being kids that want to do things correctly, they were ostracized. So to yes. come back to to come back to room fifty six, where being smart is cool, where being a good student and being a kind, civil person, that we celebrate that. That's why they came back. That's why the kids. One of the kids wrote a famous letter called it her safe haven. So that's when I started staying in touch with more of the kids because I started this class and at first I thought they'd stick around for a year or so. I couldn't get rid of them. And now I stay in touch. I still, I'm teaching kids now in the 11th and 12th grade on Saturdays because they're so disenchanted with their schools. They still feel they learn more from me than they're learning in their regular classrooms. So yeah. there's a joke. I, I speak around the world. And one of the jokes I tell all the time is I, I go to countries and people treat me like a rock star. It's crazy. And I tell them I'm really not that good. It's just that everything's so bad. I look good. So Yeah. <laughs> that's And how easy that could be for folks to just reach out if they did have a connection point with someone. I mean, I have students now that will occasionally just say, can I just come sit in your room for a little bit like that or have graduated from college uh, or they'll come over and have dinner with my wife and my, and my kids. And sure. um, just to kind of be in that world when you're not, when that world's not like, that's not what's normal for you. You know, like eating dinner together is yes. not a normal thing. So to do that with people, it's like, it's a big, it's a big deal. And, and there's something um, else you're doing that's really special there. Your students are seeing you as a person, not just as a teacher. You have a wife, you have a family. My students know my family. And, and the joke in the family is they like me, but they love my wife. And, and, but that's a good thing for kids to know. And they actually treat you with a lot more respect when they see you as a complete human being. When you first started, you're in Hobart, you're there for a few years, and you start like working your own stuff in. At what point did you start feeling like you were, you had something there? Like, like, this was a good idea. You're glad that your wife kind of pushed you in that direction. Um, what was it that was that started happening around you that kind of let you know that that was, that it was there was some magic? It was actually around the time that, where you were at. I had been teaching about 10 or 12 years. I had done a few Shakespeare plays, and they were okay in its time, but looking back, they were pretty bad. But compared yeah. to everything else that was going on. But it was when... Um, McKellen gave me a very important piece of advice that not only for the Shakespeare play, but for the class in general, he said, stop worrying about costumes. Stop worrying about scenery. It's all about language. I mean, really, what are you trying to teach them? And this is the key moment for me, CJ. I stopped worrying about the test at the end of the year. Okay. I started asking myself, what am I teaching these kids that they will use for the rest of their lives? The best piece of advice I can give our audience tonight is this, and I hope you'll try this. If you go up to most kids in school and they're working on their math or they're writing an essay and you ask them, why are you doing this? What will most kids say? They'll say, I don't, I don't know. I had I to. Or, or I had to. My teacher told me to. If you ask, I actually train my kids to do this. If you ask a Hobart Shakespearean who's working, why are you doing this? They're going to put down their pencil and they'll look you right in the eye and they'll say, CJ, if I learn this skill, my life will be better. If I learn this skill, my life will be better. Most teachers tell their students, here's what we will do today. Around my 10th year, I figured out every lesson is, here's why we are doing this today. And we are doing it to teach you a skill far beyond today. That's when I figured it out. Now, it didn't mean I was really good yet. It took me another 10 years to figure out how to execute that with every lesson. But whether I'm teaching baseball or we're writing an essay or doing a Shakespeare play, every lesson before we start, the kids and I have a talk. And believe me, the kids do most of the talking. Here's why we're doing this. If you were to ask my kids, why are they doing a Shakespeare play? They wouldn't talk about Shakespeare. They say, we're learning about language. If we speak better, we're going to write better. We're going to listen better. We're going to communicate better. And in a million jobs, that's going to make our life better. If we're working on learning how to work as a team, you can't put on a Shakespeare play alone. If you can learn to work with other people, 
your life is going to be better. So that was the key moment when Ian got me thinking about why, not what, and not worrying about what other people think. Okay. The only thing that matters is what the kids and their parents think. They are the people I serve. That's, that's really, so you just made a lot of first year teachers very sad. I think right there, <laughs> they're thinking oh. 20 years. What are you kidding me? I, I, it's, it kind of reminds me of when I was about, I don't know, my twenties, maybe my early thirties, I'm, I'm 40 now. And I had this idea that by 50, right? Like you have it all figured out. Like I'm, I'm not going to have any more, like good luck. Any issues. I'll have everything under control and you're just kind of cruising. You just become, you know, the most interesting man in the world at that point. Nope. Um, and the closer I get to 50, I'm like, I have to hurry up. It's like no, no, time's here's, counting here's down the, here. Here's, so, the bad, here's the bad news. Because you're getting better, you see more and you want to do yeah. more. So the job actually gets harder. Okay. Because yeah, I mean, if I looked at my class now when I was 25, I think, man, aren't I wonderful? Now I look at my class and go, oh my God, I'm screwing up in so many ways. I got to fix this. I got to fix that. So it never, I mean, you never get to, you know, we have an expression in my class. Uh, I, for your audience who doesn't know this, I'm obsessed with building musicians, great musicians. Yeah. My students are really good. And I ask the kids as we're performing and we're training, when are we done? And the kids have to answer, never. There is no end zone. There is no home plate. You are never done. So as a teacher, when are you done, CJ? I'm sorry, never. I, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry if that depresses people, but I also hope it excites people yeah. that the job is never boring because we're always trying to figure out the next step. And that's why I love being a teacher. And there it is. If you want to watch the entire video, I'm going to link it up here on the top uh, and in the description box below so you can go ahead and watch the entire thing. We were using an older technology. I don't know why that bar was across his face the whole time. I wish it wasn't, but you know, it is what it is. If you need anything else from us, you can reach us right at realrapwithreynolds.com. Or if you're looking for community, if you're looking for other teachers that you, that are having these kinds of conversations, please consider visiting our Facebook group, Real Rap with Reynolds Teacher Talk on Facebook. And that's it, gang. Peace.